So, um, hello everybody, um, and welcome to today's uh, candidates discussion for the Burnaby North riding. Uh, my name is Paul Holden, President and CEO of the Burnaby Board of Trade, and I'm joined today by Dr. Raymond Dong from the BC Liberals, Janet Rutledge from BC NDP, and Noreen Shim from the BC Greens. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to the three of you, uh, A, for, um, for offering uh, to serve your communities, um, and also for joining us here today. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the event is being held on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish nations. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Burnaby Board of Trade's annual partners, who are, are a great group of organisations who support the work and the programmes and initiatives that we put together uh, to support the business community, and they support us year round. Um, at the platinum level, we have the Burnaby Now and the BCIT School of Business. At the gold level, we have SFU, Pacific Blue Cross, Douglas College, Fortis BC, Electronic Arts, and ABC Recycling. And at the silver level, we have Scotiabank, Trans Mountain, Appia Development, Alexander College, and the Port of Vancouver. So to kick things off today, uh, I'd like to go over the guidelines, which have been shared with the candidates already. Um, each candidate will be given two minutes to provide opening remarks in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, and candidates are asked not to interrupt um, other candidates during these opening <coughs> statements. Um, during the uh, Q&A period, the questions will come from me and I'll be directing the questions to each person in turn and each person will have, a, have their turn to be the first one to respond to, to the questions. And we're asking candidates to stick to one minute uh, per uh, response to, to each question. Um, so to start off with, and I've got my, my trusty phone here and timer to make sure that we're sticking as close to being on time as we can. Um, I'd like to start off with a, a couple of minutes of, of uh, opening remarks by Dr. Raymond Dong on the BC Liberals. Raymond. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Raymond Dong. I'm a practicing cardiologist and have been for the last 32 years. I grew up in Vancouver, was born um, at St. Paul's Hospital, uh, spent time in uh, Chinatown for the first 20 years of my uh, life and then moved into the, the east end of Vancouver. Uh, I am running for uh, election in Burnaby North because I believe that this is a very vibrant community with lots of diversity and lots of um, businesses that need a helping hand. I've been in healthcare for three decades and I believe that it's time for people like myself to step up to uh, make changes in healthcare. I think uh, having been an observer of what's going on um, all this time that I believe there is room for improving in the quality of how we deliver healthcare and the actual model of healthcare. My hope is to uh, uh, represent uh, Burnaby North, um, especially when it comes to the development of the new hospital that Burnaby North is uh, hopefully going to get. Um, my interests uh, outside of medicine are, uh, or actually in medicine include uh, prevention of uh, health, especially prevention of cardiovascular disease, um, and quality improvement. I have been an educator for the last 30 years. I teach uh, at UBC at all levels from undergraduate to postgraduate medicine. And I've had a number of medical leadership positions over the last two decades, including president of medical staff and president of the president's council. My outside interests include the performing arts. I am a, the chair person of the uh, board of trustees at the Vancouver Academy of Music. My children went to uh, to that academy and are uh, fluent in music literacy and I support that institution uh, as their board chair. Thank you. Thank you Raymond. Um, next up is, is uh, uh, Janet Rutledge from the BCNDP. Uh, Janet, your two minutes begin now. Thank you Paul and uh, thank you to the Burnaby Board of Trade uh, for offering this opportunity. Uh, I also like to acknowledge uh, that we that we are gathered on the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Hakamaman and Squamish uh, speaking people, and I uh, and I thank them for their uh, their generous hospitality. Uh, my name is Janet Rutledge, and I'm running for re-election in Burnaby North. I've lived in Burnaby North for more than 20 years with my husband, Bill Brassington, and I should say Bill Brassington Sr. because I know that many of you uh, know my son, Bill Brassington Jr. Uh, our home uh, recently became uh, multi-generational. We share our home with our son, uh, his wife, and their two children. Uh, my grandchildren both go to school in Burnaby North. 
Uh, my household is also uh, multicultural. Uh, my daughter-in-law is of Chinese heritage and my grandchildren are half Chinese. I've spent a lifetime helping working people stand up for themselves, their families and each other. And I've played a leadership role in the labor movement, the women's movement and the environmental movement. Uh, since becoming an MLA in 2017, I've had an opportunity to develop uh, a relationship with many of the businesses in Burnaby and in Burnaby North, many of the institutions and the community groups. And I've had the opportunity of using my uh, commitment to and skills in advocacy to bring your concerns and ideas to the government so we can work together to find solutions to the things that are preventing you and those you represent from thriving. I decided to run for political office because I saw firsthand that so many people in my community were struggling because of a pattern of bad decisions made by the former BC Liberal government. I ran to be part of a government that would put people and communities first and deliver the services that matter most to you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And uh, next uh, we have um, uh, Noreen Shim from the BC Green Party. Noreen, your two minutes begin now. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I have decided to run as MLA in this election because I believe that it's time for us to have more representation, more diverse representation, and younger voices in the legislature. It's time for us to start thinking about the future and start thinking about how we implement ideas, innovative ideas and solutions today that are going to be future-proof for tomorrow. And so one of those things is, uh, for instance, no longer subsidizing fossil fuels and oil and gas, but shifting those subsidies to green innovative technology. My background is both in private and public business. I used to work for a real estate developer. Um, most notably, I worked on the sale of False Creek Village um, in 2012 from the city of Vancouver. And later on, I worked for the city of Vancouver alongside the chief financial officer there. And what I saw was that there are deep flaws within the system, whether you're coming at it from the perspective of a business or whether you're coming at it from the perspective of operations and government, there's a lot of red tape that decisions need to make their way through. And I think that we've seen through these past three years that by having thoughtful consultation with other parties, that by cooperating through minority government, we're able to see positive action and real change in our communities to help the business owners, to help the families get the things that they need. As a business owner here in Burnaby North myself, I'm not a lifelong politician. This is my first, this is my first campaign. But what I do know is that I no longer want lifelong politicians to speak for me. I want people who are able to understand the true issues of a Burnaby owner here in, in Burnaby North, we have certain issues that need to be addressed. And I believe that by having a fresh set of eyes, by having somebody who truly understands the current economic situation here in our communities, we can better serve the people around us. And truly by serving other people, we are serving ourselves. It is only in service to others that we're able to build up the infrastructure both around us and under us. Thank you, Noreen. And uh, thanks to all of you for your opening remarks. Uh, we're now coming on to the Q&A uh, part of the, uh, of the, the event. Um, and so for the first question, I'll, I'll uh, start with you, Janet, and then ask uh, Noreen and Raymond to, to respond as well. And the first question really <clears throat> is about uh, COVID-related policy, and this year has obviously represented an unprecedented uh, challenge for our local businesses. The impacts of COVID were quick and were, were drastic. Um, and and you know, during this period, we've seen business closures and, and, and curtailments. The next government will need to manage the ongoing pandemic uh, while sustaining our small business community and eventually bolstering consumer confidence. 
Uh, what is your plan for doing this and how will you support Burnaby businesses through the coming months and years? And Janet, as I say, if we can start with you. And uh, I'll just remind everybody to, to, to keep your comments or your responses to one minute, please. Uh, thank you for that question, Paul. Uh, and let me start with the issue of consumer confidence. Uh, after basically staying home for uh, um, you know, close to three months, um, consumers, I see they're starting to come back. I see the increased activity on Hastings Street. More people are shopping. Uh, more people ex are accessing services, going to restaurants. And it reflects a confidence. It reflects that we as a community have been listening to Dr. Henry as a community. More people are wearing masks. More people are keeping their distance from each other. But it also means that businesses are doing your bit as well. Um, when we go into businesses, we see the hand sanitizers, we see the directions to, to keep distance from each other and um, the barriers that are erected. So uh, customers are coming back because they feel safe. But I recognize that businesses are not out of the woods yet. They are struggling. So we are doing things to put more money in people's pockets so they have more money to spend in the community and support businesses. So there is the one-time $1,000 COVID rebate um, that people will be able to spend. We've, we're freezing rents. We have uh, eliminated MSP uh, payments. Uh, we have reduced childcare fees, all of which puts uh, money back in the consumer's pockets. But there's also things that we're doing to, to help businesses directly, like offering 15% refundable tax credit to support hiring, providing $300 million in recovery grants to small and medium-sized businesses, a temporary 100% PST rebate on new machinery and equipment to help businesses solidify their operations and help them grow. Um, we will continue to authorize such measures already started, like allowing more patios rest and restaurants to be able to purchase alcohol at wholesale prices and include liquor with takeout uh, delivery. Uh, we've reduced, we will be reducing the commission fee on food delivery apps. These are just some of the things that we're doing to help businesses, but I want to emphasize that we want to do it in collaboration with the community, with the business community, so that you have a say in what you need going forward and that we can respond to it. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And uh, <clears throat> Noreen, I'll, I'll come to you now and, and uh, I'll allow you, we, we went a little bit over the minute there with Janet, so um, Noreen and, and Raymond uh, would extend that courtesy and, and uh, uh, feel free to offer a full answer. So Noreen first. Thank you, Paul. First thing I want to acknowledge is the fact that I understand how difficult it is to actually receive the funding that's been promised um, when it comes to the times that you need it. I recognize that while these promises have been made, actually getting the money into the doors, onto the books of your business is much more difficult than, than promised. And so I think that one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now is not a lack of funding, but a lack of consultation, thoughtful consultation with business owners to find out exactly what it is that they need, what the issues are in terms of getting those problems solved for them, and then finding more innovative ways than just throwing money at a problem. I think we need to start engaging the community not just the business owners, but customers as well, so that we can understand the things that they want and need that will continue to bring them back into the community, spending money and keeping the economy going. Those of us who've been, you know, struggling through this global pandemic, we've all been doing this together. And I think we're all at, at a place where we understand that we need to care for each other. We need to make sure that we're doing the best we can when we're out in public. But that being said, we also need for strong regulation that's evidence-based coming directly from the provincial health authorities. We need to ensure that the directions are clear. We need to make sure that they are Im easily implemented. We make, need to make sure that they are actually accessible for business owners. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, Raymond, we come to you and we'll give you somewhere between one and two minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so the idea of rebuilding and um, improving confidence in the economy 
it's an issue of balances. We're looking at small business needs. We also have to look at the needs of the uh, population at large. And I believe that uh, measures that the BC Liberals are uh, going to uh, put on the table when they're in government includes the PST reduction, which is really a stimulus uh, maneuver. So that encourages uh, the uh, savings uh, for individual families of uh, the PST of up to $1,700 a year will be funneled back into small business. So that's part of the checks and balances. You have discretionary uh, capability as a citizen to spend as you wish. And if you spend in small business, that will then generate a bigger tax base and the small business will benefit. We accept that small business is really struggling in many sectors, uh, both industrial and non-industrial. And we believe that um, the balances are partly providing funding and also partly listening to small business. Completely agree that the ear of small business or the ear of government hasn't been uh, focused a lot on small business, but small business is the engineer, the, the driving engine of the economy in this province as it is in many other jurisdictions. Uh, the bulk of the employed staff are in small business uh, and the only other thing is, is big government, which we don't really want. So the important thing is to listen to the balance between the needs of small business and how we can help them with transition mm -hmm. funding for certain industries that are uh, able to receive that type of funding and would benefit from it, but also at the same time, allowing uh, um, more money to become available to be spent in the small business communities. I did a walkabout uh, several times along East Hastings and although consumer confidence on the surface appears to be building, behind the scenes, every small business owner that I spoke to said, we need help. And the BC Liberal government is uh, you know, very well intentioned to do that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, thanks Raymond. We'll come to the second question now and I'm gonna start with Noreen on this one. Uh, and I would ask you all if you can keep within a minute, I will, I'll wave my hand a little bit if we get, uh, if we start straying a bit beyond that because we've got a uh, fair few questions to get through. Um, taxation is the next subject I'd like to, to bring up and, and the employer health tax is a net new cost for businesses and currently it applies to businesses with uh, half a million dollars in payroll which um, in truth can, can be eight or nine people which means many small businesses have had to pay this tax. Uh, what is your position on the employer health tax in general and would you consider extending the payroll exemption threshold from half a million to one and a half million to remove more small businesses from this tax? Uh, Noreen can we start with you? Thank you. I think this is a prime example of not consulting with businesses and pushing through legislation that mistakenly unduly affects small businesses. Um, I don't think that this was originally intended to cripple small businesses. I think this was originally intended to shift the cost to larger corporations. And so I think that by addressing these types of, of issues in terms of implementation, we will be able to better service the business community moving forwards. Um, I think that we need to take another look at how we've structured this type of legislation and these type of services so that we're able to understand how our, effect, how our decisions are affecting business owners on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think this is one of those issues that just shows that we need to do better and that we can do better. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, Raymond, let's turn to you. Yes, um, I believe this is very uh, important as an issue because I work in healthcare. And uh, if we speak to um, the people of Burnaby North, number one is health and COVID-19 has really accentuated that need to have health. That being said, uh, because of the Canada Health Act and the universality of healthcare in, in this province, we have to fund this somehow. And healthcare is 40% of the uh, provincial budget year end and increasing as we go forward. I believe that a small business with a few employees um, really 
would find it extremely onerous to bear that burden of funding the healthcare premiums for all of their employees. And I would be in support of increasing the, um, the limit uh, in payroll total dollars to uh, a much higher value to give small business some more breathing room. They're already struggling with all these other issues in terms of um, uh, pandemic response. And I believe that this would be a, a, good, a good initiative going forward. Thank you, Raymond. Janet, let's turn to you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, let me uh, begin by saying that businesses in Burnaby North have raised this issue with me and we have had uh, conversations about how to um, make it uh, uh, fair for everybody. I would also point out that um, during their term in office, the BC Liberals doubled MSP payments and it was crippling for many people. And so we felt that, that we needed to uh, um, provide some, um, some ease to people who were struggling. Um, I would also point out that the, that the HST only applies to 15% of employers. 85% of employers are currently exempt. Now, having said that, we have been looking at ways of, uh, of tweaking it and making it, it uh, uh, appear more fair. And we, we would have done something by now, except COVID got in the way. But having said that, let's look at the other supports that we have made available to small business. For example, one of the first things we did was reduce small business tax by 20%. That's 20%. So we have a whole, and I, I see Paul is, is signaling me to wrap it up. Um, I have already mentioned a whole list of things that we're doing to support small business. And I would mention again, we are doing active things to support, to support small business. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Raymond, we'll start with you on the next one. Uh, and it's again in, in the area of taxation. And one of the top concerns of the Burnaby business community prior to COVID uh, was the burden of soaring property taxes, which are driven by the highest and best use, where the value of a property is based on its redevelopment potential, not on what it's used for right now. What is your take on highest and best use? And will your party commit to implementing solutions such as a split assessment which would save local businesses significantly on their property taxes bills. Um, start with you, Raymond, and again, one minute, please. Thank you. I uh, found this uh, taxation uh, philosophy or principle to be somewhat vexing because it's not talking about the bird that you have in the hand, but the bird that, that, that you're seeing down the road in the future. And many small businesses are family small businesses, and they're there for the long term. They're not there to... Um, change their structure or their mm -hmm. storefront to uh, latest potential. And so I think it's a bit specious to talk about the potential of that land use as opposed to the actual part of that land use. And I think that uh, this uh, policy needs to be visited and uh, more consultation needs to be required as to what is defined as best purpose or highest possible use. We cannot tax people uh, and small businesses on things that might be as opposed to things that are. So thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, Janet, can we come to you? Yes, thank you. Um, now, this is another problem that the uh, current government, the, the, the uh, BC NDP government, inherited from the BC Liberals. This has been a problem for at least 10 years, and the previous government did nothing about it. Uh, and we have lost a lot of iconic businesses along Hastings Street as a result of this. And yes, the Heights Merchants Association has brought this to me. They've explained it to me in detail. Uh, and I arrange a meeting between the Heights Merchants Association and the ministry responsible to try to come up with a fix. And what we did was we put together an interim, interim fix that would apply to the 2020 tax year. And we were in the process of working with municipalities to try to fix this uh, and give us some uh, time to make a long-term uh, change. Now, COVID again got in the way, and we will apply the fix to the 2021 tax year. Um, and of course, as I say, there are other measures that we are doing to try to um, lift the burden of small businesses in our community. 
Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Noreen, can we come to you? Thank you. I think this is a perfect example of the infighting that we've been seeing in, in government for a long time. Let's stop blaming each other for these issues. Let's stop looking at the past and let's start looking at the future. The reason that these issues are coming about is because Burnaby has an outdated official community plan. As a real estate developer, I can tell you that these official community plans dictate how real estate developers will be spending their money. And because we have an outdated plan, the zoning within that plan does not accurately reflect the type of development we want in our communities today. If we update this plan, we will help to take the burden off of many businesses who are who are struggling with this. The other issue is that it wasn't COVID, it was this election that's stopping that legislation from being passed right now, today, for this April's tax, tax year. It is not COVID. It is the NDP trying to grab power is the reason we are not currently in legislation doing this very important work. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, let's move to a different subject now uh, on climate change policy. Um, to make environmental options less costly for businesses to adopt, do you support offering more significant, in significant incentives to encourage businesses to improve the sustainability of their operations? And will you support making those incentives and supports more upfront and immediate, as opposed to making businesses wait for rebates, reimbursements or savings further down the road? Um, Janet, shall we start with you on this one? Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, let me start by reminding us all that our Clean BC plan is the most ambitious climate change, uh, climate uh, change plan on the continent. And to that end, we have committed $105 million this year uh, for incentives to businesses to move to cleaner options and another 106 million over the next three years to help schools, hospitals, and universities reduce their emissions. Uh, we are providing rebates on retrofits, electric vehicles, these things are key. But I would also uh, remind you that the climate change plan, Clean BC, is a living document. And it was created with input from the uh, public and input from business, and it will evolve in response to input from the public and from business. Our approach is collaborative, we're flexible, and we're already ahead of our neighbors in other provinces and in the United States. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Noreen, would you like to respond? Thank you. Um, last year, the oil and gas received $6 billion in subsidies from uh, the provincial government. I propose that we take the six billion dollars and take it away from the dying fossil fuels industry and we put it back into the pockets of our communities. We need to ensure that these subsidies are being put towards our neighbors, our local small business owners, in order to do these types of retrofits, in order for them to streamline operations and have more sustainable operations moving into the future. If we continue to subsidize industries that are already at their peak demand, we are only going to be subsidizing a dying future. By, I think that everybody can recognize that the BC Greens have the most uh, forward thinking uh, platform in terms of climate change. But I also believe that in order for us to help our small businesses within our communities do better, we need to ensure that we're not giving them just rebates but we're, and putting the burden of cost on them up front, but we're allowing them to utilize this money to restart the economy. Thank you, Noreen. And uh, Raymond, can we come to you? Uh, yes, I believe that uh, climate change is uh, um, uh, one of the most important issues we're going to deal with uh, now and in, into the next century. I believe that uh, climate change uh, initiatives brought up by small business uh, should be encouraged and that it's not just about reimbursing them but about finding new creative ideas and being innovative as to how we can affect uh, small changes. Climate change has to be brought about by the community as a whole in terms of educating everybody as to how and when and why we should be doing things, rewarding small business, if you want to call it that, 
for um, coming up with creative uh, new ideas and being more receptive and listening to what the small business needs are. It's not just about getting away from single use straws. There's got to be more to climate change than that. And I think small business is integral in terms of its uh, impact, in terms of uh, its impact on uh, making these changes. And I believe that uh, waiting to rebate somebody or reimburse somebody uh, for something they've already done, we should be actually at the beginning and the forefront in front of this issue um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Um, on to uh, uh, another subject now, and that's the subject of childcare. Um, for many years now, the Burnaby Board of Trade has, has believed that uh, accessible childcare is, is pivotal to workers being able to return to their jobs and full productivity, uh, but also as a long-term strategy to increase the participation uh, rate of women in the workforce. Could you speak to how you view the role of childcare in our economy and what your plans are for making childcare more available and affordable? Uh, Noreen, can we start with you? Thank you. Sonia Firstineau, our party leader, has suggested that we piggyback um, daycare services onto our current existing public school system by including early childhood education um, under the purview of public schools. What this does is utilize underutilized space sitting empty across BC. It only makes sense for us to utilize existing infrastructure instead of building new purpose-built facilities. That being said, childcare is at present, um, the wait list is four to five years long. If you haven't registered your child for childcare before conception, you simply are out of luck. And so one of the things that early childhood Hood education would offer is not just discounted childcare, but free childcare for all families that need it. And by including early childhood education for three to four year olds, you're freeing up daycare spaces for uh, children who are one to two years old and really need that specialized daycare, uh, those specialized daycare services. Thank you, Noreen. Raymond, over to you, please. Right. Uh, so, childcare. Um, should not be a barrier for parents and especially uh, mothers who uh, would be uh, useful in augmenting the workforce and trying to earn a living. Everyone's trying to make ends meet and having an extra uh, income never hurt. The BC Liberal government will be subsidizing childcare for uh, low income and middle class families with a prorated uh, scale from 10 to $30 a day per child depending on uh, the family's total income. We need to ensure that the 10,000 added childcare spaces uh, will be um, built, provided, and well-resourced. We need to know that every parent has a right to childcare and that we have to ensure that the childcare is appropriate. Uh, the children that we, uh, are, the children are our future. And we need to make sure that um, uh, early developmental um, procedures are, are set in place and that our children are well cared for and we will uh, ensure that that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Janet. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, well, I'm, um, I'm pleased to see that we, were, we are all of a mind about the importance of childcare and of a comprehensive childcare plan. Uh, child care is actually uh, a hallmark of uh, NDP uh, principles and values and core of, of our vision. Uh, child care is to the 21st century what uh, universal health care was to previous generations, um, a, a program that was also initiated and driven uh, by the NDP. It's transformative and it must be a priority. Uh, it's what will attract talent and skills to the province, and it's what will allow uh, family incomes, in many cases, to get them above water, and in other cases, make them uh, thrive more. Um, I also want to point out that I am on the uh, Child Care Working Group, which is a subcommittee of Cabinet. We have a comprehensive 10-year plan. It is a $1 billion plan, and we are building it out every year. With regard to schools, I couldn't agree with you more. It's already in the process. We are building before and after child care at schools right now as we speak. 
Thank you, Janet. Uh, we'll come on now to the uh, last but one question. Uh, and this is on transportation. Um, as, as we know, uh, a key benefit to locating a business in Burnaby is our central location uh, within the region and our proximity to key transportation and transit infrastructure. What do you think are the key transportation challenges in our region and what investments in infrastructure need to be made to ensure we can continue to move people, goods and services through Burnaby and across Metro Vancouver? And I'll turn, uh, as I say, Raymond, to you first on this. Uh, thank you. Uh, transportation um, is critical in Burnaby because it is a hub. It separates the Point Grey from Hope and uh, everything going into town in terms of work, business uh, and uh, access to uh, higher levels of health care go through Burnaby. <clears throat> it's important to note that in the BC Liberal plan, the $8 billion in new investments in infrastructure, the number one ticket item is actually transportation. Right. The three-year plan is to spend in the total rebuild BC plan $11.9 billion in transportation. That includes um, decongesting some of the traffic through Burnaby, through other routes such as the uh, Massey Tunnel, Massey Bridge uh, project. It includes uh, improving uh, rapid access, which then speaks to um, uh, rapid transit, which speaks to uh, climate change. And I believe that um, these capital investments are uh, part of the uh, big plank in the BC Liberal Rebuild BC plans. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Janet, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, our community in uh, Burnaby North faces a lot of transportation challenges. It, it is a hub, but it is also uh, for, for many commuters, uh, a pass through community. Uh, people go through Burnaby to get from downtown to their homes in the valley and it creates uh, congestion on our main streets and it can create suggest congestion on side streets that people use as shortcuts. It creates parking problems and it takes a toll on those in our community who commute, whether they commute by car or by, by public transportation. And it creates pollution, uh, be it noise pollution or from exhaust fumes. We have committed to build more public transportation, more routes so people have to uh, transfer less, more electric vehicles, more uh, bikes, uh, electric bikes. We have committed that the, our bus fleet will become a zero emission. We have um, uh, committed to a SkyTrain to Langley and to UBC, which will be transformative. And building all of this creates good paying jobs, for people who want to stay in this community because they love it in this community. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Noreen? I think you're on mute, Noreen. Thank you. I think that the answer to this question, again, lies in the root of the problem, which once again is our outdated official community plan. The Green Party advocates for the idea of 15-minute cities, where everything you would need, including work, services, shops, all within a 15 minute walking distance of your home. By having the official community plan design the communities this way, we not only take the pressure off of single passenger vehicles, we're also encouraging people to walk because, not because they have to, but because they want to. We engage our communities by having a more tight-knit infrastructure. This also encourages the developers to be paying for this type of infrastructure instead of the taxpayers. If the developers are, are profiting off of densification, then shouldn't they be the ones paying for it too? Thank you, Noreen. And I think we've got time just for one last question, and, and I'll ask you to be reasonably brief on this one. Um, we've noticed that a hallmark of the response to COVID-19 by all levels of government has been what we've been calling an orientation to yes. As an organisation ourselves, we're, we're passionate believers in finding the way to yes, and, and we've certainly seen that uh, during COVID. And you found willingness uh, to act on files that maybe have uh, been considered dormant or, or, or to get new programmes launched quickly, such as allowing restaurants to expand patios and liquor service, um, or rolling out new funding and support programmes in record time. Can you comment on this? And do you think this should be a model for how government can be more responsive and nimble in the future? And I think Janet, we start with you on this one. 
Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, yes, I um, I I'm very excited about how nimble uh, we've been able to be in response to the challenges of COVID. Um, I'm proud that we were you know, quickly able to move to um, uh, patios, to um, relaxing rules on liquor sales, uh, commissions on uh, delivery apps. Uh, and I would point out that regulations are not meant to be etched in stone. They're not meant to be barriers. They're meant to protect the consumer, the business person, and the staff. And we need a regulatory framework that is um, suitable to the 21st century. And it's in that context that we have, we have reviewed the Canada, the uh, BC Labour Code, uh, WorkSafe BC. Um, and yes, um, uh, my colleague from the Green Party has uh, talked about uh, misplaced subsidies. And we have agreed that we would review who in our economy gets subsidies for what purpose. So again, um, we need to know the experience of business people to get it right. We want to be collaborative and we want to be responsive in our approach. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Noreen. Thank you. I think that the, um, the agility of the government that we've seen, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that we have a minority government or had a minority government. It puts the pressure on the other parties to ensure that they keep their promises. By working together, we are able to come up with more innovative solutions. By cooperating across party lines, we're able to have everybody's voices heard. I think that this is a big part of why we were able to see such good solutions being implemented so quickly. And I would like to see this continue. And I think that the only way that it does continue is if we continue holding our government accountable by having our elected officials also have a voice in the legislature. A majority government stops many, many people from having their voices heard. And the idea of crowdsourcing has been around for a very long time, but simply under different names. The reason it's so effective is because when we all put our minds together, we work towards a common goal and we come up with much, much better solutions. Um, having worked in both the private sector and the public sector, I deeply understand red tape and the barriers that it presents. And I will work diligently to ensure that it is easier for both businesses and individuals to understand access and implement government services. Thank you, Noreen. And finally, we'll come to you, Raymond. Thank you. So the phrase, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, COVID brought that out. And in parallel, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how small business and healthcare, we were able to bend the curve and flatten the curve because communication amongst all the stakeholders in healthcare was adaptive and nimble. If we were to stall like governments uh, tend to do in terms of bureaucracy and regulatory changes, we would still be uh, exponentially rising on the first wave. So for governments to be able to be adaptive, I think it's a tremendous idea. I think it's a model going forward that uh, when voices are heard and responded to in a quick and uh, normal fashion, communication is the strategy. And I believe that um, having open channels of communication between small business and government is important um, and critical. It doesn't mean that we have chaos. It doesn't mean that we have anarchy. It means that we have a uh, means of accelerating important initiatives going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. And, and thank you to all the candidates today, to Janet, to Noreen and Raymond. It's been great uh, chatting with you today um, and, and to, to hear your views on, on some really important issues uh, that, that we raised. So, so thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, thank you all today. Wish you all luck and, and thank you for, for, for stepping up to serve your communities. It's, it's a vitally important role and we thank you for, uh, for offering your services. Um, so, so we obviously encourage everybody to get out and vote. Uh, cast your vote by mail uh, during the advanced voting or on, it, on election day, which as we know is Saturday, October the 24th. Um, just one, a couple of quick things to wrap up. Uh, next week is Small Business Week. Uh, we have a number of free events that are going on. So please check out our website at bbot.ca to see what the events are. And at lunchtime on Thursday, the 5th of November, we're having our annual uh, Business Excellence Awards. It's gonna be a virtual event this time around, um, but please check that out and get onto the website and register 
uh, to attend the, the Excellence Awards. Um, thanks again to our uh, candidates today. We do appreciate your time and uh, um, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.